Okay. Last time we began to discuss the problems with the traditional stimulus response or SR theory of learning, one of which comes from a classic study of taste aversion by Garcia and his colleagues. And you'll recall that what Garcia and his colleagues did was to take a compound condition stimulus, bright, noisy, sweet water, and pair it either with a foot shock delivered while the animal was drinking, which elicits immediate unpleasantness, or with X radiation delivered while the animal was drinking, which uh, elicits delayed unpleasantness. And then what Garcia did was to test the animal's fear in the presence of the water by giving them two different sources of water to drink from, to choose from, either bright, noisy water, water accompanied by the light and the noise, or sweet water, water flavored with saccharin. And as I showed you last time, the animals that were shocked preferred the sweet water and tended to avoid the bright, noisy water, whereas the animals that were irradiated tended to prefer the bright, noisy water and to avoid the sweet water. What we have here is an, in is an in interesting instance of the violation of the arbitrariness assumption because all three of these elements have been paired equally well with the unconditioned stimuli, yet it turns out that it's easier for an animal to learn about the association between light and noise and shock than it is to learn about the association between taste and shock. And it's easier for the animal to learn the association between taste and nausea than it is for it to learn the association between light and noise and nausea. Now, last time I argued that this experiment violates, the results of these experiments, first and foremost, violates the arbitrariness assumption of the stimulus response learning theory because the arbitrariness assumption says you can take any conditioned stimulus and pair it with any unconditioned stimulus and get conditioning. It turns out not to be the case. It's much easier to condition fear of shock to, or avoidance of shock, to light and sound than it is to taste. It's much easier to condition uh, aversion to X radiation or nausea to taste than to light and sound. Apparently, rats are built by evolution to associate taste with the gastrointestinal consequences of what they ingest. And they're built by virtue of evolution to associate the uh, uh, sights and sounds in their environment with things like pain. So not only do, do these results violate the arbitrariness assumption, they also violate the assumption of the empty organism because they tell us that we have to know something about the organism's evolutionary history, how it is built as a biological uh, creature to understand what it can learn and what it can't learn. And then I think I said in passing last time that this experiment also violated the assumption of association by contiguity. And the reason for that is the elements of the compound condition stimulus are all equally contiguous with the foot shock, and they're all equally contiguous with the X-ray, okay? Yet, some of these stimuli get associated with these, with some of these conditioned stimuli get associated with these different unconditioned stimuli and others don't. Moreover, if you think about it for a second, the animal may feel the foot shock, certainly does feel the foot shock and doesn't like it, but the animal doesn't feel the x-rays when they're being delivered, okay? You don't feel those things, but what the animal does feel is the nausea that occurs much later. So we have a condition in which a, a condition stimulus, the taste of the water, can get paired up with nausea even though there's a big delay between the taste and the nausea. 
So this violates the assumption of association by contiguity as well by showing that an association can be formed between events that are widely separated in time. What I want to do today is to pick up on this problem of association by contiguity and demonstrate in some other ways that it is not the right principle uh, of, of, of association. Here, for example, is what's known as the standard paradigm for classical conditioning. This is a schematic diagram of essentially what Pavlov did, and for that matter, what everybody else does who, um, uh, who, who studies uh, uh, classical conditioning. We have a condition stimulus, the bell, which is presented at roughly the same time as the food, bell, food, bell, food, bell, food, and by virtue of the repeated pairing of the bell and the food, the animal comes to salivate to the bell in the same way as it salivates to the food. And remember, the standard explanation of this is that because the bell and the food are presented close together in time, that's what association by contiguity means, close together in time, that an association is formed between them. All well and good, except that here is another paradigm in classical conditioning known as delay conditioning. And here, the onset of the condition stimulus occurs, and then some time later, the onset of the unconditioned stimulus occurs. And the fact is that even though the onset of the condition stimulus and the onset of the unconditioned stimulus are now separated by an appreciable delay, you still get good conditioning. You still get the animal responding to the bell uh, the way it had responded to the food. They could say, well, all right, the onset of the conditioned stimulus is delayed. The, the onset of the unconditioned stimulus is delayed with respect to the onset of the conditioned stimulus, but there's still this period of time when they're together where the animal is getting food and the bell is still on. All right, that leads us to a third paradigm in classical conditioning known as trace conditioning, where the bell comes on and then it goes off, and sometime later the food comes on and then later the food goes off. Here, there is a delay between the offset of the conditioned stimulus and the onset of the unconditioned stimulus. They're no longer presented together at any point in the procedure, but you still get a fair amount of classical conditioning. You still get the animal salivating to the bell as it salivated to the food. And to kind of nail down the point, here is a fourth variant on the classical conditioning paradigm, known as simultaneous conditioning, where notice that the onset of the conditioned stimulus occurs at exactly the same time as the onset of the unconditioned stimulus, and the offset of the conditioned stimulus occurs at exactly the same time as the offset of the unconditioned stimulus, yet, as this line indicates, no conditioning occurs. How could that be? If conditioning, if, if forming an association was a matter of associating temporally contiguous events, you ought to get a very nice association between the uh, conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus because the two stimuli are occurring at precisely the same time. You can't get more contiguous than that, yet there's no conditioning that occurs. Okay? And if any further demonstration needed, here's a paradigm known as backwards conditioning, another variant on classical conditioning, where the unconditioned stimulus comes on, the food is presented before the conditioned stimulus comes on. So it's food bell, food bell, food bell, all right? And even though there's some overlap, and even though the onset of the food and the onset of the bell occur pretty close together in, uh, in time, still no conditioning occurs. Notice that in backwards conditioning, the temporal arrangements are exactly the same, except that they've been reversed. Food shortly followed by bell, 
whereas in the standard paradigm, it's bell shortly followed by food. When the bell is followed by food, you get conditioning. When the food is followed by the bell, you don't get conditioning, okay? Even though the temporal relations are otherwise exactly the same, the two um, uh, events are occurring close together in space and time. Let me say one more thing about backwards conditioning. In fact, what you get in backwards conditioning is not just the lack of a conditioned response, you will actually get the inhibition of a conditioned response or a, the suppression of a conditioned response. We see this very clearly in a paradigm known as fear conditioning where tone is paired with shock, the tone CS is followed by the shock US, okay? And what happens when you do this is that you get a con the, one of the physiological responses to the unconditioned stimulus shock is heart rate acceleration. The animal is afraid, and when you're afraid, your heart rate uh, speeds up. That's a physiological index of fear. And what happens is after repeated pairings of the tone and the shock, you get heart rate acceleration to the tone as well as to the shock. That's a conditioned fear response. Now that's true if you uh, uh, use the standard paradigm where the tone follows shock. You'll get the heart rate acceleration to the tone, what's known as a conditioned fear response. But if you make the arrangements the reverse, where the shock comes on and then the tone comes on, you don't get heart rate acceleration during the tone. In fact, you get its opposite. You get heart rate deceleration to the tone, okay? The suppression of a conditioned fear response. Why would that be? What? Oh, well, hello? That's right. Exactly what's happening. Uh, the, uh, in the standard paradigm, the tone communicates to the animal, you're going to get shocked. Okay? In the backward paradigm, the tone communicates to the animal that you're not being shocked anymore. You're not going to get shocked for a while. Okay? It's, kind, it's almost like a safety signal. So here, in backwards conditioning, you'll get the inhibition or the suppression of, uh, of, a, uh, of a normal uh, uh, conditioned, uh, conditioned response. So what these points illustrate is that associations are not formed according to a principle of, contingent, of, of, of a contiguity. Instead, associations are formed by a principle of contingency. By contiguity, we mean that the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus occur together in space and time, co-occur in space and time. By contingency, we mean that the conditioned stimulus predicts the unconditioned stimulus. In the standard paradigm for classical conditioning, where the CS and the US occur close together with the CS preceding the US by a short interval, the, the uh, CS and the US are both contingent and contiguous. They occur close together in space and time, but more important, the conditioned stimulus predicts the onset of the unconditioned stimulus. In delay conditioning and in trace conditioning, we degrade the contiguity between the CS and the US. They're no longer appearing so close together in space and time, but it's still the case that the CS predicts the US. It's always the CS comes on first and then the US comes on later, where the CS and the US are contingent but not contiguous, you still get okay conditioning. Notice what happens in the simultaneous case. The CS and the US, they're contiguous with each other. They're appearing as close together in space and time as any two stimuli possibly could, but the contingency has now been degraded. When the, when the bell comes on at the same time as the food, or the tone comes on at the same time as the shock, okay, the, the CS isn't predicting anything anymore, okay? Uh, and in backwards conditioning, where the US comes on and then later the CS comes on, what the CS is actually predicting is the absence of the unconditioned stimulus. So we get conditioning so long as the CS and the US are in a contingent relationship, regardless of the contiguity, even though, uh, as, as long as the CS predicts the US, 
you're going to get um, you're going to get uh, conditioning. Okay. So what we're looking at here now is the importance of the information that's provided by the conditioned stimulus to the animal. When the unconditioned stimulus is contingent on the conditioned stimulus, then the conditioned stimulus is providing information to the animal about what's going to happen next. When the bell comes on, the bell tells the animal, you're going to get fed. When the tone comes on, the tone tells the animal, you're going to get shocked. But in the simultaneous case, what the tone tells the animal is, you're being shocked. And the animal already knows that. Okay? He doesn't need that information. He's got no use uh, for that information. So conditioning occurs because and only if the conditioned stimulus provides information about the unconditioned stimulus. Where the uh, conditioned stimulus is not informative about the unconditioned stimulus, conditioned stimulus, uh, the conditioning simply isn't going to occur at all. Okay, let's take a break for a second. Any questions about these various paradigms and what their implications are? Association by contiguity appears not to be the principle of association. Association by, co by contingency is the principle. It's not whether the CS and the US occur close together in space and time that's important. What's important is that the CS predicts the US. Yes? Sure. In delay conditioning, where am I? Here, okay. In delay conditioning, the onset of the unconditioned stimulus is delayed by some interval, okay? Notice that this interval between onset of CS and onset of US is longer than in the standard case, okay? So there's a delay between the onset of the one and the onset of the other, okay? But Notice that there's still some overlap. The conditioned stimulus is still on when the food comes on, okay? In trace conditioning, the conditioned stimulus is gone before the food comes on. It's called trace conditioning because it's as if you have to have a trace of the CS in memory for conditioning to occur. But it's that interval between the offset of the CS and the onset of the US that makes the difference between delay conditioning and trace conditioning. Is that okay? Okay. Anything else about this? Yes. Well, what, what trace conditioning and delay conditioning both do is to degrade contigu uh, contiguity because the interval, the time interval, between the onset of the CS and the onset of the US is now longer than it is in the standard case, okay? But in all three of these cases, the onset of the CS still is a perfect predictor of the US, and that's what's important. Oh, uh, no. If there is, that's because of a slip of my hand. There isn't more response. These are supposed to be identical. Well, there's, more, there's only more response. There's only more response because the CS is on longer. Okay. So that's all. It's, if you look at it just in terms of probability of response, it's the same. One more question. Okay, no, in, in, the, uh, in the standard pairing, the CS and the US are both contiguous and contingent. They occur close together in time, and the CS predicts the US. In delay conditioning, the contiguity is degraded. They no longer occur so close together in space and time, but the CS is still a predictor of the US. In trace conditioning, they also are not so contiguous any longer. They don't occur so close together in space and time, but the CS still predicts the US. In simultaneous conditioning, they're perfectly contiguous. The onsets and the offsets are exactly at the same time, but the CS no longer predicts the US. No conditioning occurs. And then finally, in backwards conditioning, again, 
The interval between onset and offset is supposed to be the same here as in the standard case, it's just that it's backwards now. So they're as, in some sense, they're as contiguous as they are in the standard case, but the CS no longer predicts the US. What the CS predicts is the offset of the US. Okay? Now, let's add a variant on this just to try to make it even clearer. Let's look at another famous experiment in the uh, conditioning literature by Leon Kamen uh, on what's known as the blocking uh, effect. In Kamen's experiment, he used a compound stimulus of noise and light, the onset of the noise, the onset of the light, exactly the same time, onset, offset of the noise, offset of the light, exactly at the same time, and then there, this compound condition stimulus is paired with the unconditioned stimulus. So what happens here, of course, is the animal's going to acquire a conditioned fear response. The animal's going to acquire a conditioned response to this compound stimulus. But what Kamen did was to decide to test the elements of the compound uh, uh, conditioned stimulus separately. So what he did here was to condition the animal to be afraid in the presence of the compound stimulus, noise and light, and then just test the animal's response to the light alone. And what came and discovered was that the animal gives a good, solid fear response to the elements. That's true for the noise uh, as well. So even though the animal's been conditioned to a compound condition stimulus, it shows a conditioned fear response to each of the elements. But now what Kamen did was something a little tricky. He breaks this up a little bit. In the first phase of the experiment, he conditions the animal to noise paired with shock. Noise shock, noise shock, noise shock for several trials. Then what Kamen did was to introduce the light as a compound condition stimulus. So now it's noise and light, shock. Noise and light, shock. Noise and light, shock. And then what Kamen did was to test the animal's uh, conditioned fear response to the light, and he saw that there was no conditioned fear response to the light. Contrast the absence of the conditioned fear response when the animal's first condition to the noise and then to the noise and light compound, the animal doesn't respond to the, uh, to the light compared to the first version of the experiment, where the animal's conditioned to light and noise right from the get-go, and then shows a strong conditioned response to the light. What seems to be happening here, this is a depiction of uh, Kamen's actual results, where animals are conditioned to the noise alone, and then you test the response to the light. If they're conditioned to the noise alone, they don't show any fear to the light. If they're conditioned to the compound alone, they show a fear response to the light. But if they're conditioned first to the noise and then to the compound, they show no more fear of the light than if they had never been exposed to the light at all. This is known as the blocking effect. Conditioning an animal to, um, uh, to the noise blocks the acquisition of conditioned fear to the compound. And what that tells us is that there's something very important going on. It's not just association by contingency that's important here, but that conditioning apparently only occurs when the unconditioned stimulus surprises the organism. Conditioning only occurs when the unconditioned stimulus surprises the organism. When the organism is surprised by something new that's happening in its environment, hey, I'm getting shocked now, what the animal does is to search the environment for a predictor of this event. So, okay, I'm getting shocked now, I'm gonna to try to figure out when this can happen so I can grit my little rat teeth or whatever it is that the animal is going to do, okay? And then what happens is that when the animal finds a predictor of the unconditioned stimulus, it focuses its attention on that and ignores other events that are irrelevant and ignores other events that are, uh, that are redundant, 
with what it already knows. So to go back here for a minute, here, noise is paired with shock. Shock is the surprising event. Noise is a reliable predictor of that event. The animal figures that out during phase one. In phase two, noise and light are paired together with shock, but the animal's already got a perfectly good predictor of the shock. He knows when the noise comes on, he's gonna get shocked. So he ignores, the animal ignores the light so that when you test the animal's response to the light alone, it hasn't acquired any kind of fear. Conditioning occurs when the unconditioned stimulus surprises the organism. Conditioning occurs when there is an event in the environment that can serve as a reliable predictor. When an animal has a reliable predictor of this previously surprising event, it focuses on it, ignores everything else, so that no matter how many times the light is paired with the shock in this circumstance, the animal won't show any fear to it. We'll, just, we'll never acquire any fear to that shock because it says, I already know about this, okay? I already know about this by virtue of the light. So that just goes to show that what's happening here is that cl in classical conditioning, it's not just that environmental events acquire the power to evoke reflexes, which is what I said at the end of last Wednesday's lecture, okay? That's not just what's going on here. In classical conditioning, what is happening is that the organism is developing expectations about what's going to happen in its environment. It's, it's, got the, it's developing the ability to predict by virtue of conditioned stimuli what's going to happen with respect to unconditioned stimuli. It develops the expectations that the uh, conditioned stimulus is going to predict the, un, uh, the unconditioned stimulus. Okay? Uh, quick questions on the blocking experiment. The point is, no conditioning occurs when a CS is redundant with a known CS. And that's exactly what we have here. By virtue of phase one, we've already got a known CS. Here, the new CS is just redundant with the first one. No conditioning occurs. Okay, now that's for classical conditioning. Let's look at the same kind of thing in the instrumental case, okay? Here we have a phenomenon known as learned helplessness, studied by Martin Seligman, Steve Mayer, and Richard Solomon. That's the same Solomon I told you about uh, before. What they're doing, what, what, what this experiment involves, is a variant on the avoidance learning paradigm that I told you about before, where you have dogs in a shuttle box, and a tone comes on, and later shock is gonna come on, and the animal can escape and avoid the shock by moving from one side of the shuttle box to another. And what I told you last time was that animals, dogs, learn this perfectly well. They learn this very, very, very easily. Um, and I, uh, I outlined for you uh, Maurer's two-process theory of avoidance learning by which um, uh, uh, Maurer argued that First, the thing that happens in avoidance learning is that the animal acquires a conditioned fear to the tone, and then the animal acquires an instrumental response that gets rid of the shock and turns off the tone. If that's the case, okay, that the first process in avoidance learning is the acquisition of fear to a tone, okay, Seligman and his colleagues uh, predicted, well, they knew better, but for the purposes of the experiment, they predicted that if the animal's already afraid of the tone, then avoidance learning ought to go even farther, even faster, because you've already got the first part of the two processes uh, accomplished. So what they did was they took the dogs and they put them in a Pavlovian harness, standard Pavlovian uh, conditioning uh, procedure, and then just presented the animals with tone followed by foot shock, tone, foot shock, tone, foot shock, tone, foot shock, uh, in the same way that Pavlov paired the bell with food, bell with food, bell with food. Um, and they were able to show that in this, in this circumstance, the animals acquired a very solid conditioned fear response to the tone, okay? And so they've already, they already know to be afraid of the tone. 
Then they put the animals in the shuttle box where the tone came on, followed by shock, and the animal could escape or avoid the shock by moving back and forth from one side of the shuttle box to another. And what they discovered was that in, con in contrast to the predictions of the two process of, of Maurer's two process theory of avoidance learning, the animals who were treated in this particular way did not acquire the avoidance response. Okay? They failed, or at least avoidance learning was very retarded on the part of these animals. Okay? So here we have a, uh, one of their experiments, avoidance learning in the shuttle box. These animals were treated, some animals were treated with uh, unsignaled, inescapable shock. When just a shock came on, they had no kind of predictions at all, okay? And then some animals got, uh, uh, got a signaled uh, shock, and here are the results of the experiment. Control animals that didn't get any treatment at all, okay, they make the avoidance response really fast. Here are the animals that got the, uh, the inescapable shock, the, the pre-shock treatment, and you can see that there are lots of escape failures and when, they, when the animals did make an escape, they took a long time doing it. This is the phenomenon of learned helplessness. Preconditioning to the conditioned stimulus actually retards acquisition of, a, uh, of an avoidance response. Here is another example, uh, another version of this, where uh, the animals are, uh, these are control animals that don't get any kind of pretreatment, okay? Um, here we have animals that are actually allowed to escape when the shock comes on. And then these are animals that are yoked to these animals. They get the same amount of shock, but they're not allowed to escape. They just get the shock delivered to them. Then everybody's put in an avoidance learning situation. And what you can see is that there are lots of escape failures. When there's an escape, there's a very long latency. It's another variant on learned helplessness. So what happens here is that You've got an illustration not of the role of predictability so much as the role of controllability. When the animal is in the Pavlovian harness and he's being subjected to standard Pavlovian fear conditioning, tone followed by shock, tone followed by shock, tone followed by shock. What's the animal learning? The first thing the animal's learning is he's learning to predict the shock, okay? Tone is followed by shock. But what else is he learning? Right, tone is followed by shock, and there's nothing I can do about it, okay? He's learned that this is a situation in which he has no control over the shock, and what happens now is that the animals will generalize this negative expectation when they're put into the shuttle box, where the same thing is happening uh, uh, as before, tones followed by shock, tones followed by shock, tones followed by shock. Whereas a standard dog, a dog that hadn't been given this pretreatment, would run around and eventually stumble on the escape and avoidance response, these animals literally sat in the shuttle box and took the shock, okay? They seem to be un, they seem not to know that there was anything that they could do about this. So again, in instrumental conditioning, it's not just that voluntary behaviors come under the control of environmental events. In the same way that in classical conditioning, animals learn to predict events in their environment, in instrumental conditioning, animals learn to control events in their environment. Prediction and control is what's being learned in classical conditioning and in, uh, and in instrumental conditioning, okay? So that's basically what's happening with the learned helplessness experiments. Exposure to inescapable shock during the Pavlovian fear conditioning situation retards acquisition of an avoidance response, apparently because the animal learns through the classical conditioning procedure that Okay, the tone, the CS is predicting the shock, but the situation is uncontrollable. Those negative expectations of control now generalize from the Pavlovian situation to the avoidance learning situation. 
Okay, any questions either about the Cayman, we're going to do one more experiment today, uh, Cayman blocking experiment or the learned helplessness experiments, anything at all? Yes? In the learned helplessness uh, situation, they learn that their environment isn't controllable. Remember when we talked about the differences between classical and instrumental conditioning? And one of the differences is that in classical conditioning, reinforcement is independent of the animal's behavior. Okay? Cell followed by food. Tone followed by shock, no matter what the animal does. Whereas in instrumental conditioning, reinforcement depends critically on the animal's behavior. If, the, if Thorndike's cat doesn't press that pedal, it's never going to get out of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the box. So the prior Pavlovian or classical fear conditioning basically taught the animal that the tone was going to follow, be followed by shock and there was nothing you could do about it. It was an uncontrollable situation. Whereas if you just put an animal in an avoidance learning situation in the shuttle box, what it will do is it will not only look for a way to predict what's going on, it will look for a way to control what's going on. Okay? These animals had already learned, the helpless animals had already learned that they couldn't control anything in their environment. Tone was going to be followed by shock no matter what they did. Was that okay? Okay. Anything else about helplessness or the blocking experiment? Yes. Will the animal's fear diminish once they realize that the shock's unavoidable? Well, what happens, to be honest with you, what the, the, the fear that the animals show, the conditioned fear, is eventually replaced by what you can only call depression. If you've ever looked, if you've ever seen a sad dog, okay, these are very sad dogs. Uh, they, they, they whimper, they look sad, they kind of have kind of downturned faces, just, well, they're, they're, they're mammals after all. They have facial expressions of emotion just like we do. Um, Seligman himself has suggested that learned helplessness can be a laboratory model for some kinds of depression. And indeed, in some depressed individuals, not all depressed individuals, but some depressed individuals, we find that they show a, uh, a life history of uncontrollable events, that things just, bad things happen to them and they seem not to be able to control them at all. Uh, and that's why they get depressed. When bad things happen to you and you can control those bad things, you either get determined or you get angry, right? But when bad things happen to you and you can't control them, eventually what happens is you get resigned. And that's what these animals did. They just kind of get resigned to this whole thing and they'll, they'll sit there. Now, I, I want to point out that these experimenters were not intentionally cruel to these animals. These, ex these experiments didn't go on forever, okay? And in fact, after these experiments, the animals were retired to a very nice farm in eastern Pennsylvania where they lived very nice dog lives uh, afterwards. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, for the purposes of the experiment, you know, these were, this was not a good thing to do. Fortunately, Seligman and his colleagues did the experiments right the first time. They had all the controls in place right from the get-go, so nobody had to repeat their experiment with a new batch of dogs to clean it up. Uh, again, Seligman is quite clear that if you're going to do these kinds of experiments, you have an ethical obligation to do them right the first time so that nobody has to do it again. Qu question? Um, is the depression irreversible? Ah, is the depression irreversible? The depression is irreversible unless you take some active steps. What Seligman and his colleagues ended up doing was taking these helpless dogs in the shuttle box, grabbing them by the harness, and actually dragging them from one end of the shuttle box to the other. And eventually the dogs got the message. Okay? Now, that just took a while, because in the first place, if you're a dog and there's somebody dragging you from one end, you wonder what the hell that's all about. Right? But eventually, the animals got the idea. Okay, it just took them a really, really, really long time, but eventually they recovered because they learned 
that they could control the environment after all. But in the standard helplessness situation, uh, the, the, the animals just don't take any opportunity to learn. Uh, they, they have to be shown that the circumstances are quite different. And just to make the connection to, to depression again, there's an important uh, 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 psychiatrist, Aaron T. Beck, Tim Beck, uh, who won the Lasker Award a couple years ago for uh, his invention of what's known as cognitive therapy for depression. And um, Beck noted that a lot of depressed people come in and say, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do the other thing. That's part of their depression. Uh, and Beck uh, invented a therapy in which he systematically taught patients that they could do these things, okay? And when they learned they could actually do the kinds of things that they thought they couldn't do, their depression began to lift in much the same way that helplessness began to lift in these dogs. So this is, this is an experiment that actually had a two-edged positive sword to it. The learned helplessness experiment showed how certain forms of depression might occur and also helped show what we could do about uh, treating that particular form of depression. Anything else about these? Okay, we've now undercut all four of the assumptions of the traditional stimulus response theory of learning. We've undercut the assumption of association by contiguity, showing that contiguity isn't the principle of association, contingency is. We undercut the principle of arbitrariness by showing that certain stimulus response associations are much easier to form than others. You can't just select CSs and USs arbitrarily and expect animals to learn them. We undercut the principle of the empty organism first by showing that you have to understand something about the animal's biological structure, how its nervous system evolved to understand why Pigeons can learn some things, but not others. Why rats can learn some things, but not others. But now we've shown you that you, the, the experiments that also undercut the assumption of the empty organism by showing that you don't have to just know what, how the animal's brain is wired. You also have to understand what's going on in the animal's mind. What does it expect? What does it think is going to happen next? What expectations of control does it have? These these expectations of prediction and expectations of control are critically important uh, for understanding the behavior of animals in learning situations. And then finally, especially these last experiments, the Cayman blocking experiment and the Seligman learned helplessness experiments, undercut the assumption of the passive organ. Animals in these learning situations are not being conditioned by the environment. Cayman's rats in the blocking experiment are actively searching for a predictor of shock. They're surprised by the shock. They're looking around to try to predict. Seligman's um, uh, dogs are trying to learn what's control, what, what, they, what they can control in their environment. Animals in learning situations are actively searching for prediction and control. There's nothing passive about the learning process. The final point about traditional uh, uh, theories of learning, uh, which will reinforce some of these other points, con uh, uh, concerns the role of reinforcement. It's kind of a corollary to stimulus response learning theory that learning only occurs when a conditioned response is reinforced in the presence of a conditioned stimulus. In Pavlovian conditioning, the conditioned response to the, tone, to the bell is reinforced by the present, presentation of food. In, uh, in uh, Thorndikean uh, instrumental conditioning, the conditioned response of pressing the paddle is reinforced by escape. Traditional learning theorists held the view that reinforcement was essential to learning and that in the absence of reinforcement, no learning would occur either in the classical or the instrumental case. Enter Edward C. Tolman, psychologist at the University of California, Berkeley, after whom Tolman Hall is named, with a very simple experiment in maze running and rats. I'm sorry for the quality of this. I'll try to get a, a, a better view of it. I thought I had done this. This is actually a picture of Tolman's uh, maze. 
Here's a, a kind of schematic diagram of it. In this experiment, um, standard, standard maze learning experiment involves putting a rat in a start box, putting a piece of food, you know, a piece of cheese or something, in a goal box, and the animal will learn to navigate the maze to get from the start box to the goal box. And the traditional view of this learning is that learn, the animal's learning of its way through the maze is reinforced by the food that it finds in the goal box, okay? Without that reinforcement, the argument went, no learning would occur. So what Tolman did was a very simple experiment in which he had one group of rats that was put in the goal box and reinforced for finding their way to the, put in the start box, reinforced for finding their way to the goal box in the usual way with food. Another group of animals was just allowed to run around in the maze. They never found any food in the goal box. They just were just put in the maze, and they were allowed to explore it. And then there was a group that uh, was put in the, in the maze for a while, allowed to explore the maze for some trials, and then all of a sudden, reward was introduced in the goal box. Here are um, uh, Tolman's results. We've got animals being tested over a period of 16 days. Here's a group that never got any food reward. And you notice that they don't learn very much, okay? There's no real change in the amount of time it takes them to get from the start box to the goal box. Here is another group, this group, that is regularly rewarded for food right from the start. And you see that they gradually, progressively learned their way to the goal box. This is a standard instrumental conditioning kind of outcome. But look at what happens with this group that received no reward for the first 10 days of the experiment. And then on day 11, suddenly, when they got to, the, to, 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 to uh, a particular place in the, uh, in, in the uh, maze, they found uh, a food reward. What happens here is that for the first 10 days, these animals behave just like animals that aren't getting any food reward. Well, that's not surprising. They're not getting any food reward, okay? But now, on day 11, their behavior changes precipitously. Once they discover that there's food in the box, they now begin to behave like animals that were regularly rewarded. These animals apparently learned over the first 10 days how to navigate around the maze. But they had no particular reason, if you will, to get quickly from the start box to the goal box. On day 11, they suddenly found out, hey, there's a reason for me to get from point A to point B. Okay, I get a piece of cheese. Uh, and now they start running really fast. It becomes clear from this experiment that over the first 10 days, the animals had learned a lot about the maze even in the absence of reward. But they only put this learning to use when there was a reason. There was, they only put this learning to use when they could use the learning to find their way quickly uh, to food. This is a phenomenon known as latent learning. And Tolman argued that learning occurs in the absence of reward. What, re, what reward does is get the animal to act on what it's learned get the animal to behave in accordance with what it's learned. So finally, we can say that with the latent learning experiments, it makes it very clear what it is that's being learned in learning. In classical and instrumental conditioning, all these various variants on these experiments, the animals are not simply acquiring associations between stimuli and responses. Rather, what these animals are doing is acquiring expectations. In the classical case, expectations about the outcomes of events. Tone's going to be followed by food. In the instrumental case, expectations about the outcomes of their own behavior. Pressing a paddle is going to be, a, is going to be followed by, uh, by escape. Predictability and controllability. What's happening here is that animals are not just changing their behavior in result of experience, which is our traditional definition of learning, 
these animals are acquiring knowledge about their world, knowledge about what's going to happen, knowledge about what's going to control what, knowledge that enables them to predict and control the world about them. We'll say more about how organisms acquire knowledge next week when we talk about sensation and perception. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend.